shore. For much of the year, quiet stretches of beach nestled between bay waters, populated by a few winter-weary cottages. Tidal marshes, for the most part unadulterated. Shallow pans, creeks, woodlands, farmlands. A relatively unobtrusive region surrounded by some of the largest oil shipping ports in the world and the lengthening shadows of metropolitan empires. Unassuming as it appears, this highly sensitive ecosystem comprising the lower 50 miles of the Delaware Bay supports a great chain of life year round. Here in early spring, the horseshoe crabs, which come ashore by the thousands to breed. And then, for about three weeks in May, the tranquility is broken. Utter chaos erupts as a million half-starved shorebirds descend upon the scene from South America. They've come to gorge on tons of horseshoe crab eggs the fuel essential for the next leg of their strenuous journey, a 3,000-mile non-stop flight to the Canadian Arctic breeding grounds. The timing each year of the horseshoe crab's appearance and the bird's arrival is uncanny, heralded in the Delaware Bay as a rite of spring. Wintering grounds in South America. In Peru, no vegetation grows on this stark desert coast. It rarely rains. For the most part, life on these beaches is hot, dry, uneventful. The sanderling spends much of the day running up and down in front of the waves, picking out sand crabs called emerita. At the same time, Red knots are spending their non-breeding season principally in Tierra del Fuego, Argentina, and to a lesser extent in Florida and Texas. The coast of Argentina has very high tides with strong winds blowing dust from inland, depositing it into a hard shelf where mussels grow. The soft-billed knots feed off the young mussels, or spat, storing food for the flight north. The knot is a robin-sized sandpiper gray in the winter and russet colored in the breeding season. By March, the knots in Argentina and sanderlings in Peru and Chile begin to molt and take on their breeding colors. They are about to embark on an eight to 10,000 mile journey to the far reaches of the Canadian Arctic. The knots begin moving north in short flights up the Argentina coast. Then they make a flight of four or 500 miles to a wild, pristine lagoon called Lago de Pesci in southern Brazil. This is a staging site, an area rich in food supplies, in this case a large quantity of small snails. The lagoon is quite shallow, allowing the birds to wade for their food. After two or three weeks, the birds have doubled their weight in preparation for their long flight to the northeastern coast of South America or the mid-Atlantic coast of the United States. The Sanderlings from Brazil use the Delaware Bay as its stopover before heading to the Canadian Islands. Arriving in great flocks on the Delaware Bay beaches sometime in May, usually around the fuller new moon, emaciated, spent of all energy, here they can rest and feeding on horseshoe crab eggs, quickly replenish the fats urgently needed for flight and breeding in the Arctic. Time is of the essence. The short tundra summer allows little time for mating and caring for the young. This stopover point is crucial. 
It is not unusual at this time of year to see 75,000 shorebirds in one flock feeding at the tide line. The birds spend about three to four weeks on the Delaware Bay, shuffling between several beaches throughout the day, foraging when the tide's going out and roosting on the outer beaches at night. It is calculated that the birds will consume about 320 tons of horseshoe crab eggs during their stay. Until recently, little was known about these elusive creatures. Following their migratory pathways to the ends of the earth, a few scientists have helped shed some light. Dr. Peter Myers is associate curator of ornithology for the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia. This is a phenomenal event. These shorebirds have migrated from all over South America to reach the shores of the Delaware Bay. They've arrived ravenous, having used up all the food resources they put on somewhere on the shores of South America. They've flown, say, six to 8,000 miles, some nonstop, all the way from South America. You can imagine their reaction upon arrival. Exhausted, thank God I'm here. Now what they have to do is replenish all that energy they used, put on more so they can make it off to the Arctic. While they're here, not only do they have to worry about putting on new fuel, finding a place to roost at night, they also have to worry about things that are after them, things like merlins and, and peregrines that actually make their living by eating migratory shorebirds. Shorebirds comprise about 48 species. They are not necessarily all residents of the shore. The term refers to biological relatives. Predominant on Delaware Bay's beaches are sanderlings, ruddy turnstones, red knots, and a profusion of semi-pomated sandpipers, commonly found at Moore's Beach. The spring phenomenon was first recorded in 1813 then inexplicably ignored by even the most prominent ornithologists. When the ornithologists did begin to take note of the occurrence, they realized that Delaware Bay represents the second largest concentration of shorebirds in North America during the spring migration. And it is by far the principal breeding location for horseshoe crabs on the East Coast. The horseshoe crab is one of the most ancient and primitive life forms on Earth. Living on clams and marine worms, which they mash with their legs as they walk, these deceptively forbidding creatures are more closely related to the spider, tick, and scorpion family than to true crabs. Having spent the winter offshore in the Atlantic Ocean, they migrate into Delaware Bay in late March to spawn. In May, emerging as the tide begins to ebb, the males patrol just offshore until they encounter a female. It is not uncommon to find as many as five to 15 males surrounding one female. Using its front appendages, the male clasps onto the female shell and is then dragged onto the beach. The female burrows into the sand using her back legs to dig a hollow nest into which she extrudes the eggs which the male then fertilizes. Karen Williams is a station biologist with the New Jersey Marine Sciences Consortium. Sampling sections of the beach, she's found evidence indicating that the female may deliberately deposit her eggs at depths and distances from the shoreline least likely to be struck by predators. One individual female may lay as many as 50,000 eggs. Only two or three will hatch. As spawning continues, the eggs begin to pile up in drift lines. It is believed that exposure to the sun and air has depleted the food value so that the shorebirds will not eat them. But these eggs attract the gulls. Tides uncover nests and crabs dig up other nests to make their own and soon the waters are filled 
and there is not one square foot of beach that doesn't contain eggs. In spite of the abundance of food around, the birds squabble intensely. The ruddy turnstones dig holes to get to the implanted eggs. They perform great dueling battles amongst themselves to maintain rightful ownership of their hole. Once the turnstone has snapped up all the eggs within reach of its short bill, it abandons the hole, leaving it for another species to claim. Scientists like Dr. Myers, a world expert on the Sanderling, have made a lot of important discoveries about migratory patterns and why these birds make these incredible journeys. Early evening, a mist net is set up in the surf in hopes of catching the birds on their way to roost. Okay, now I'm gonna move that end out. This helicopter's gonna cause chaos. The whole flock up there is gonna scoot. Luck is in their favor. A small flock is sighted. The work must be done quickly. Sensitive to any form of stress, birds lose weight easily. Entangled in the nets too long, they can expend a great deal of energy and die. are weighed and separated by species. This one weighs 43.2. This is a young bird. brown those At the lab, three or four bands are placed on the birds color-coded according to the date and place where the bird was found. Really good plumage on that bird. <coughs> by banding them and then by looking at these birds in migration, we can actually track the migratory pathways of different populations from their wintering ground in South America to their breeding ground in the Arctic. Now, the return rate is not especially high, but we actually see something like 5% of the banded birds that we've marked in South America on migration in North America. And I have to believe that many of the birds that we see not only are faithful to these sites, but they're also absolutely dependent upon them. The following day, the birds are released. Lately, there has been renewed concern over declines in the sanderling population. The cause may be the use of pesticides near feeding grounds in South America, exacting neurological damage, or loss of staging sites along the migratory route. These concerns are compounded by other conservation problems. With shorebirds, in many senses, all their eggs are in one basket since they concentrate in such massive flocks. An oil spill on the Delaware Bay at peak season would hinder not just a bird here or there, but in one fell swoop, wipe out the horseshoe crabs, leaving the birds without resources to reach their breeding grounds. The end result would be the devastation of the entire shorebird population east of the Mississippi. New Jersey has an emergency response squad on alert should an oil or chemical spill occur. But other threats exist. Human harassment. Steve Paterzo, a biologist with the New Jersey Endangered Species Program, calculates that just ordinary walking on the beach disrupts feeding. And this problem is mounting as each year more and more visitors crowd the beaches to take in this spectacle of nature. The birds should be heading north by early June, 
but with constant interruptions, they may be seriously delayed. The horseshoe crabs are also suffering from human invasion on their spawning ground and outright malicious abuse. A $1 million mitigation agreement between the state of New Jersey and public service electric and gas may prove to be the largest step ever taken for shorebirds conservation. This money will allow the state to acquire certain beaches in surrounding habitat. Paul D. McLean is director of the Shorebirds program in New Jersey. The beaches of the Delaware Bay are an alive ecosystem. They're changing all the time. This particular area, since 1978, the beach has actually moved back. The dunes have retreated almost 130 feet. At one time, there were three streets out in the Delaware Bay where there's one remaining now. So what we're trying to do is protect this barrier beach not allow people to build any longer on these beaches and maintain these beaches in a natural system. We know they're going to move back, so we're buying back about 500 feet into the marsh to make room for these beaches to move back and still provide the nesting area for the horseshoe crab. Uh, shocks such as this have been here since the last 30 or 40 years. Two or three hurricanes have resulted in them being torn down the ice comes in in the winter time with the wind, cuts the pilings out under them, and they go down. So this is not the place for man to live. We would like to keep this area here for the shorebirds, which have been coming here for centuries. Aerial surveys are being sponsored jointly by the New Jersey and Delaware non-game wildlife programs to determine the numbers, species, and distribution of migrating birds along the Delaware Bay. With over 50% of our coastal and marsh areas rendered unusable to migrating birds, the preservation of the Delaware Bay has international implications. Kathy Clark, a technician with the New Jersey Endangered and Non-Game Wildlife Program, coordinates the ground and aerial surveys. Some of the best information we'll get from this uh, are being able to look at population trends over a number of years. Peter Dunn from the Cape May Bird Observatory identifies the birds for us. Um, I count as we're going along, and a staff member from Delaware Non-Game does the recording for us right on topographic maps. The plane goes approximately 70 to 80 miles per hour, about 100 feet in the air, um, which is rather slow for a plane, but we count them by flushing. We go um, as close as we can to the beaches so that I can see all the birds and Peter can get a good idea of exactly what the flock composition is. And you can get to all the beaches that don't have road access to them. There are a lot of beaches, especially in Delaware, um, that would be just impossible to count unless you were in a plane or in a boat. The plane has a definite advantage in giving us a simultaneous picture of what's on the bay. Last week we were counting in groups of thousands we counted over 280,000 birds on both sides of the bay. The problems that the Delaware Bay faces also plague other sites in the hemisphere. Since the birds depend on a chain of sites to complete their migration, it is important that all the sites be managed. In May of 1986, officials from New Jersey and Delaware gathered to dedicate 25 miles of shoreline in the two states as a preserve for birds and horseshoe crabs, making it the first in what is proposed to be an international shorebird reserve system throughout the Western Hemisphere. Brian Harrington from the Manomet Bird Observatory in Plymouth, Massachusetts, has been following the migration of the birds, primarily the red knot, since 1974. His work, banding and marking birds, corroborates Dr. Meyer's findings that birds are utterly dependent on certain stopover sites and there can be no substitutes. Our marking programs have shown that the population size of the North American knot is on the order of 150,000 birds. So we know that at any one time in late May, that roughly 75% or 66% of the population of red knots can be here at one time. So we're 
fairly convinced that the resources at Delaware Bay that they use are a singular resource. There's nothing else available to them. And should that resource be lost, we believe that the whole species would be in dire trouble. The red knot, which I just saw, had a green flag on the lower left leg and a little red band on the lower part of the right leg. I know that that combination is one we used in Situate, Massachusetts to mark knots two years ago and that it was one of 200 birds we marked at that time. We can also mark red knots with various combinations of different colored bands, for example, red above green or and yellow above orange on the other leg. And with that kind of combination, we can tell the very individual bird that we are looking at. And then with a telescope working in Brazil or Argentina or New Jersey or Massachusetts, we can search through flocks and find birds whose identity we know at the individual level. This is important information to us because it allows us to determine population sizes, how many red knots there are. It also allows us to identify the migration routes. The knots will spend about 10 days to two weeks on the Delaware Bay shore. By the time they depart, they will have increased their weight from 130 grams upon arrival to 200 or 210 grams by the time of departure. Before they are about to leave, shorebirds eat very little. They mostly just sit in large flocks, preening and bathing. The resources that they obtained in the Delaware Bay will fuel the flight northward and supply energy for the intense period of courtship and mating that will ensue. With the bird's departure, the beaches once again become the domain of the horseshoe crab. After spawning, the adult crabs head back to the water. Wandering in circular trails, they sometimes become stranded. Burrowing in the sand to keep from being parched by the sun or picked on by gulls, they wait for the next high tide. The waves can be fiercely uncooperative. Struggling to right themselves, their legs are of no avail. They have but one tool to give them leverage, the telson, a stinger-like projection, which is not a weapon, but is used for flipping over. This process of being flipped can happen as many as five to six times, but most of the crabs will make it back to sea. Little is known about these mysterious creatures who have inhabited the earth for 300 million years. Once the eggs hatch, the larvae swim off and disappear. Dr. Myers and his staff have much work ahead of them. As the tide ebbs, they patiently tag the crabs. That's purple now. OK, so this is another uh, pair here. Um, I can't believe what that pair did today, the ones that we found down the beach. It's impossible to believe that those two came back to, again together after having been separated during tagging and are actually uh, clasping again. With as many crabs out there as they are, that's so vanishingly improbable. It implies that uh, a lot more is going on than we had thought. Most shorebirds will fly directly to the Arctic islands of Canada, arriving between the 1st and 5th of June. The typical red knot clutch of four eggs weighs about 60% of the female's fat-free weight. Within 10 days, several clutches are laid. Like many of the shorebirds, soon after the 25-day incubation period, the female knots leave the brood and care of the males and begin their migration south. Two and a half weeks later, just around the time the young are able to fly, the males depart, leaving the young to find the wintering grounds on their own. 
The Bay of Fundy is of prime importance for many species on their southward migration. Like the Delaware Bay, this staging area is extraordinarily rich in animals. The most important one may be the corophium, the shrimp-like crustaceans that pervade the mudflats of the bay in the thousands. It is estimated that between 70 and 90 percent of the Arctic breeding population of the semi-palmated sandpiper passes through the upper bay. The value of staging areas like the Bay of Fundy and Delaware Bay cannot be underestimated, since through evolutionary time, shorebirds have developed a dependency on just a few such sites. Only 11 major sites have been identified in the Western Hemisphere as having adequate resources for replenishing the fats that are needed in migration. These sites cannot work alone. They are critical links on a route to survival. The Delaware Bay. It is up to the state to protect this vital staging area for the shorebirds. They belong to the Western Hemisphere. And just as New Jersey must look out for the Delaware Bay shore, so each staging area of the hemisphere must be cared for so that we can protect these citizens of the world, the shorebirds.